Now, we talked a lot about individual learning, transformative learning, the three overarching processes, the ten more specific phases. We talked about the origins of where Mesereau's theory comes from and where he's pulled from. We've talked about where it's going. And in between, we talked just briefly about social action. This video is going to get more into social action as well as its origins in something called critical theory. which holds, or holds, actually, the belief in a faith that human beings are able, capable of coming together, rallying, and figuring out a way to transform the bonds that sort of hold them down and oppress them, and recognizing that they're always there, and there's always a different way to improve one's life, or what Habermas would call the life world, by addressing the system that contains it. Um, because at any given moment, there is something about the system that contains the life world. So I want you to think about it. We'll start in terms but by talking about how the one of the central assumptions is that there is sort of a handful of people, just a small group of people, who maintain, oh, they had a third person there, who maintain their power collectively by controlling resources and call these resources such as money and information from the masses within a given system so these little dots down here are just going to represent the masses so we have just a handful of people who are controlling the resources and keeping the resources and information to themselves, or mostly to themselves, uh, in relationship to the masses. It's important to first look at the philosophers that um, influenced Paulo Freire. So if you go all the way back to ancient Greece, there was the idea that some people could get together right, in small pockets and rise up. right? to create change within the system. Brookfield calls this type of change uh, an emancipatory, uh, and others call it an emancipatory form of education. Okay, And to do that, the idea is to look at the sort of mechanisms and constraints that make it difficult and limit options to control these resources. So an emancipatory education focus is in on those limitations to break down and actually control resources that only a, a certain few people are controlling. Um, so there are a few different things that are really important when it comes to uh, questions that you can ask about this level. Okay, The first one is, when you are in a system and learning is occurring, whose interests are really at stake? Now, whose interests are really being served through the learning? Okay. Another thing is, who actually has access to those learning um, uh, opportunities and potential? And we can't assume that everybody has access. For instance, we know that not everyone has access to the internet, and so there immediately you've got a power inequity that creates a difficulty for people to find information elsewhere. Another example of this are authoritative regimes that control, uh, for instance, internet access that prevents people of a given society from understanding other things that are going on in the world. They're sort of trapped in these constraints. A third one is looking at here both the intended and unintended consequences of structured opportunities. So when the opportunity is given here, a ladder, let's say, to break through, what are the intended and unintended consequences? We know that even people who have the best intentions, uh, usually there is a dark side involved, or a shadow side, or unintended situations that can occur when helping somebody uh, move forth. The fourth one 
are, what are our assumptions regarding knowledge itself? We talked about this a little bit earlier in our videos about habits of mind, when we talked about epistemic dimensions of habits of mind. Where does knowledge actually stem from? Is it possible to gain knowledge from here? Is knowledge out here? Is it shared? Uh, and last but not least, this is really important, the location of knowledge. So is it within the person or society? So just in, to wrap it up for this video, what we did was we looked at basically what social action uh, and critical theory are looking at, which is basically a, a look at and the assumption that people who are down here have the ability to change their world as long as they work together and they examine the types of societal structures that are keeping them down. And a lot of times they don't even realize that it's keeping them down. And it's this lack of realization, or mindfulness as you might call it, uh, that is referred to as a hegemonic system. That is, these people believe that what is being done is in their best interests, right? So they're given these opportunities, so to speak. You think about the United States, um, one of the assumptions is that it's a meritocracy. We can work our way to the top if we only work hard. But there are so many unintended uh, consequences when it comes to that. And even though we think that the system is helping us, it actually can unfortunately be hurting us. And that is what is known as hegemony or hegemonic system. So this is uh, a very light sketch of what social action is and what critical theory is but it has a lot of its roots in Marx and Marxism, and there are much deeper studies that you can get involved in to understand and break these down even further. There are a lot of different ways that you can look at these, a lot of different theoretical lenses, such as postmodernism and feminism. So you have a lot of, not only you know, sort of an outline of what we're looking at here, but there are many different lenses that you can look into as gateways for understanding the hegemony that exists in society in order to, as the Greeks would say, create a praxis and actually break through those boundaries instead of perpetuating them in a sort of self-sustaining system.